One of the greatest things in life is a sneeze. Oh, jeez. This is how Best we kick shit thing off. ever. I sneezed all over myself there the other day, though, <laughs> just before playing a show. And it was one of those ones where, like, phlegm comes up, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was just all over my T-shirt. And I couldn't change, so I just had this kind of, like, green vibe. Dude, I, <laughs> it's delicious. This happened to me the other day. I don't know why I was starting off like this, but whatever. Um... I was catching a flight the other day and it was like one of those ones where it's like you get held in that the tunnel before the, the yeah, plane or whatever so annoying. it is. Anyway, so there and I had a huge and I sneezed. I, I, it was the biggest thing there. I don't know what left my nose. <laughs> it landed in my hand. And I, and I didn't don't know, what, know to, what to do. And I, so I was just basically holding like a hand suitcase of just flesh until I got it. It was actually the most... Disgusting. Mine also thing. just happened on a plane in a in a tunnel as well, waiting to get on the plane. Really you also have done. Yeah, that sneeze that I was just telling you about was the exact same situation. But luckily it kind of like missed my hand. Well, not luckily. <laughs> but I managed to like get it off, you know, but then I was like And then you have to do that subtle thing. <laughs> <laughs> you're like picking up the, the paper bag, you just threw in the bin, and you're like, wait, did I leave something in that paper bag? <laughs> <Too late. laughs> Nothing in there, I don't think. I don't think I can find anything in that. That's like getting Oh, the there's shit. my coffee. <laughs> Are you traveling a lot at the moment? Yeah, loads. What, loads. What, like how many flights? Um, well, so I just had like a little period off. I think I've just been traveling again for the last maybe like three days. So yeah. I've probably taken like three or four flights. Um, and then I had like a little holiday, which was nice for like seven days. Yeah. And then before that, I think I was probably flying most days. It's probably a flight every, well, it depends really. Like sometimes if it's, a, if I'm in Europe, I'll fly almost every day or every second day. And so it could be like 10 days, uh, 10 flights or something. Do you not get knackered? It, it's exhausting though, right? It is quite exhausting. Yeah. You don't get enough sleep. That's for sure. And you're like mm. trying to sleep. Like I had a horrendous journey there. I was going to play a show in Belfast and I had to travel from like the south of France during like all the trouble of flights and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we did like, I think it was, it was just one of those things where I had the day before I had also flown out there on like little to no sleep because it was a super early morning flight. And then the, to leave there the next day, I had to get up again at like five again after going to bed at maybe like midnight or, or one o'clock. Um, and it was like a, an hour long drive and then like four hours in a train and then a, and then a flight and every single seat you get into, you're just like, Trying to catch a snooze, you know, you're like, okay, a little bit more sleep. But I get this on flights now. I don't know what I, I don't know. I, I don't know what it is within me, but I it may it must be the altitude. Mm. But I almost, if I fall asleep on a flight, I wake up panicking that I can't breathe. <laughs> yeah. do you, don't, you don't have this? No, no. I do that every single time, and and maybe I think it's because of lack of sleep. I don't know because I've that's been very strange. Yeah, I've been traveling a huge amount. We can get I, that checked out, man. But dude, I want to. We've met before. Yeah. Um. Uh, a mutual friend of ours was hosting a night and you were singing in it. And I was, one of those times, I had been traveling, so I was exhausted. And I had to introduce you to st onto the stage. Mm -hmm. And embarrassingly from my side, I totally messed up. It's not that embarrassing though, because it's like, so I do have like a weird name. I'm pretty sure the first thing I said to you when yeah. we met was like, hey, I'm Keen to Crow, don't mess it up. <laughs> you did. That's exactly what you said to me. And I was like, that guy, first of all, is definitely going to think that I'm such a prick. Because I was like, either he's going to understand that it's a joke, and I was trying to come up with a funny first line, or you were going to be like, that guy is rude. Uh, you probably thought I was rude. No, I didn't think just... you were rude at all. <laughs> I was like, I was like, he's, he, he's joking, all this kind of stuff. But also... There's a bit of seriousness to it. And I, and so that made me then panic even more. Yeah, so yeah. then when I came to interview, I went, hey, I, don't know what I, I didn't even know <laughs> what I said. I I completely messed up. Because you're net, and I saw, I think you were on something else before, where, where your kin is obviously Irish and then the de Croix bit, which is meant to be French, which is de Croix. Yeah, du Croix. De Croix. So, so who's French in the family then? My mum. Mum's side is French. Mum is French, yeah. Fluent French? As in like she grew up there or? Yeah, yeah. My mum's fully Okay. As French as it goes. But she like has lived in Ireland now for maybe 25 years or something. So she's got like a cock of French accent. <laughs> Kian, like, will you come empty the dishwasher? <laughs> so it's like the funniest kind of accent that you'll ever hear. But interestingly enough, I, I, I did like a, when I was on tour, I did a, an interview. I can't remember exactly what I was doing, like loads of back to back radio ones. Mm. And someone said to me, by the way, congratulations. You are no longer on the how to pronounce list at radio. And I was like, 
first of all, I didn't know that was a thing. Mm. Secondly, that's kind of cool. He was like, that's a big deal. It means people now know how to pronounce your name, you know? But I think that is true, though. I think there's there's yeah. honestly something within it where suddenly someone starts knowing and pronouncing your name, and that is like a yeah. a weird sort of odd stepping stone. Did you ever think about changing before, when you were coming into music, did you think about, okay, maybe I could change it to make it easier or anything like that? The only thought that I ever had was to just be keen. But even that people would still get wrong now that I realize. Because it's spelled C-I-A-N. I, yeah. But I like at the time I had that thought when I was still living in Ireland and Kean was a super normal common name. Mm. And then I moved like 40 minute flight across the pond and everyone was just like, I had teachers calling me like Shan <laughs> and Chan. And I was like, it's obviously not Chan. So <laughs> yeah, you know? my name is obviously not Chan. But what was it like? So, so talk to me about growing up because you grew up in Cork. Yeah, and uh, I've been to Cork before. It, you know, it, it's it's kind of a quieter place, right? And before moving to London, it's you know beautiful and green yeah. and pleasant and all these different things. And so, growing up there, did you know straight away that, that you wanted to go into music? You wanted to be a musician? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, it was like I think I had a few things I wanted to do growing up. Uh, music was always probably one of the main ones. Mm. I always, for a really long time, wanted to be an actor and then I wanted to be a skateboarder. Those are like the three things. Actually, I had a phase of wanting to be a magician as well. Um, but the ma but mainly music was always a thing because my mom is a professional musician. Therefore, it was never something that I questioned as a possible career path. Mm. So it was like a lot of people I know who did music or who had the, I, the thought of being a musician as a kid or whatever, their parents were like, oh, go be a doctor or a lawyer or something like real. But I never had obviously that. And obviously my mom was super supportive in me doing like whatever kind of creative job I would have wanted to do. Um, so pretty much as long That's as funny though, because you're right. And typically parents within the industry always try and make their children stray away from it because they realize how competitive, how hard, mm. how tough it is, the rejection behind it all. And, and you know, I, I don't know your your mother's story, but, you know, I, I definitely know from, from, from my place, having been in sort of the entertainment industry, right? Yeah. You know, having done reality and all that kind of stuff. Man, it's tough. Oh, yeah. It's real tough. Yeah. And, and Kim, with you, which I imagine, right, and I want to hear all the backstory as well, is that, you know, you we talk about now people know your name and you're, you're blowing up and you've got number one albums and things like that. But everyone sees the, the success now. No one sees the back history of how long it takes, how yeah. many hours of practicing, performing, how many, uh, you know, going onto the street and singing with people, whatever it is. It takes ages and, and the rejection yeah. and the hardship. And, and you, you wouldn't want to put that on your kids, I don't think. Yeah, I think it just depends, like, what somebody wants to do. Mm. I think it's more about, like, if my kids really wanted to do something, um, and they were passionate enough, I think I would let them do it just because simply I think joy comes from doing something that you love and happiness comes from doing something you love. And I've always been very, very happy in my life because I've always tried to pursue and do things that I love no matter what, even when I was super unsuccessful. And yes, it's really, really difficult and it can be like soul crushing at times, but part of you is still just like, well, I would still do this for free for the rest of my life, even if I was like, broke i would like if there was nothing i could do you would still if do i it. was just busking like i would still do it no matter what because it's what i love to do um what is it about it that you love because you know t you talk about being a magician or being an actor or you know being a musician or it's also that performance space mm -hmm. what is it within the performance space that you love so much i think it's probably begins when you're like a, a child and like making people laugh or making people sort of surprising people or um, which I think any anything of that, first of all, getting a reaction off a crowd, but I also like real life connection with like real humans. I think that's such an amazing thing mm. to like be on a stage and get this, feel this energy from an audience, um, feel their sense of surprise or their sense of excitement or emotion. I love being able to evoke emotion within people. I think it's such an, a, an amazing thing to be able to do. Um, and then just like, obviously you get like a buzz and excitement. Um, but yeah, I think there's probably, there are probably a lot of sides to why someone would want to be an artist or performer mm. for many different reasons. I think there's another side, which is probably like seeking approval for like probably the rest of your life, seeking love, seeking, you know, 
uh, all those kind of things. And definitely there is. Yeah, why do we have that? I have a little bit of that as well, I think. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, where I thought, I don't know, especially when I did, you know, it, it's interesting, Ryan, sorry to cut you off, but it's interesting, right? You, you know, I went down this route of doing Made in Chelsea and doing this kind of stuff. And, and before I did that, I think I was without knowing, I think it was just this, I was a bit of an insecure kid, I must have mm -hmm. been, right? And I think that's probably from childhood, boarding school, et cetera, divorce, maybe all those kind of things. But then... I thought, okay, if I appear on television, yeah. that means I'm going to receive some sort of fame or whatever it is. And yeah. that means then, oh, I'm going to get all this love from all people and that's going to cure everything. And actually for me at the beginning, it did the total opposite. Yeah. It made sort of strangers like me, but friends sort of detract from me. And yeah. I think there's that, there's that element of, yeah, seeking validation or... Yeah, I, I, I definitely think when people want to be, not all the time, but I see it in a lot of performers, there's that sense of... Yeah, I feel like this is going to complete me in a sense. It definitely is. You're definitely seeking a feeling of like this sort of fulfillment from like people and stuff like that as well. And I think it's like I'm lucky in one sense because I do something that I love, which is making music and performing music. And music is the thing I love the most in the world. So I very easily get to sort of try and avoid or like yeah, maybe avoid that side of myself that maybe is seeking like some sort of filling maybe a void or something maybe from childhood from school from you know like in school I was ne I didn't have a lot of friends I was never cool I was bullied all that kind of stuff so I think part of you is also like there was definitely a part where I consciously was like well I'm going to prove you guys wrong and one day you're all going to want to be friends with me and now I'm living that part where everyone wants to be friends with me and all the people that didn't like me at school or wouldn't invite me to their birthdays come up to me and they're like yeah what's up and I'm just like I'm like, I don't care about you now. <laughs> yeah. And like, why yeah. did I think that this would? But it's funny because there's a part of it that's just like, oh, well, that's stupid. I don't think that way anymore. But I think, yeah, there's everybody. There's has, that initial part, right? Yeah. Which is where and everyone I want wants to, to be you. loved. I think, you know, everyone wants to have that feeling of love from people, whether it's strangers or whatever. So, but it's definitely like important to seek the right thing. I think there's a lot of people who seek fame, no matter, like just fame. And I think that's, not something that you should do through something that you love you know like don't do it because you want to be famous do make music because you love making music and that's i think why i i never struggled because i always i just wanted to be a musician no matter what it didn't really matter to me all that mattered to me was like the goals that i had and it's never be it was never to be famous it would be to be i want to play in this venue how do i perform in this venue okay i gotta write songs that will reach people and then I will do these steps. It was, and it was only about those kind of things and the feeling because I would have these dreams in my sleep where I would perform in a venue and then I would wake up and be like, like I would feel so incredible. And I'd be like, I have to do that. How do I achieve that? How do I make that dream that I was just having there at 10 years old while I was sleeping into a real feeling that I get, you know? And then essentially it was just chasing Matt, which is kind of weird. Is the same feeling now when you perform in places, is it the same feeling you had in that dream? Sometimes, yeah. And that's, that's unbelievable. Wild. Yeah, unbelievable. It's wild that your body can almost predict what it's going to feel like. I know. And it's crazy that like I was having dreams like that as a kid. Like it's insane to be, it's yeah. almost like a curse in a way, but it's also like a blessing. But like I didn't have a choice. It's like, it's like if the world is just like, here's the best feeling in the world but that wasn't actually real. And if you want it to be real, enjoy chasing it for like the rest of your life, you know, or for the next 10 years. And I think it was like so, it was 10 or 15 years that I chased being able to even get close to that, you know. Well then, does it, does it then become some sort of a drug then where you start feeling that emotion and you're sort of chasing it the entire time? Um, maybe to an extent because... I think the biggest thing I learned is that emotion isn't, that feeling isn't every time. You don't always have that buzz. And sometimes you go out and you play a show and it's supposed to be the thing you've dreamt of doing your whole life and the best feeling in the world. And you didn't really have fun. You know, like I, I did two shows at the O2 where I supported Ed Sheeran and the first one I didn't really enjoy. I just, some, some things happened and it was really just, it, I just couldn't enjoy it. It just wasn't fun. And I was so sad when I left stage. I was in such a like a terrible mood because I was like, I can't believe I've dreamt my whole life of playing at the O2 or whatever. And but then the second night was like incredible. And then I had that feeling. And then but when hang you, on, stay on that one. Why why is the first night not good? You're you're 
performing at the O2 with one of the biggest artists in the entire world. Yeah, I know. But you left grumpy. <laughs> <laughs> that makes me sound like <laughs> such a prick. You know what? It's, you shit. know what? It's little things. You because perform badly or what? No, it was more that like I to enjoy to really fully enjoy performance. I things can't annoy me, and things bother me extremely easily when I'm on tour. When I'm in that like high intensity environment of doing something like that, where I have to comfortably in my mind go out in front of 20,000 people and not be nervous and I don't get nervous like at all but because I don't get nervous I don't want to get nervous or have a th like something that could make me nervous because that would ruin it for me and there are certain things that had happened that sort of messed up within the f probably the two or three minutes to me going on stage that went by the moment I was on stage I was like panicking of being like like I wasn't on time to start the song and like there was all these things that were like were like stuff that like no no one had even like noticed and nothing actually probably went wrong out there but I was panicking being like oh my god what if I don't get to the microphone in time what if I don't and then suddenly I'm on stage at the O2 and I'm and I'm pissed off because something had happened that had messed up this whole thing and it's really hard to get back into like just saying, get back in the room, get back into the moment, like enjoy yourself. And yeah, it's just a tough, it's a tough thing to do, you know? It, wait, is, is that though just reading into it? And perhaps I'm totally wrong here. Is, is that because when you tour, I, I suppose when you're touring, right? And you're doing your thing, you have complete control. Mm -hmm. So you can say when you go on, when you come off, you know exactly what's going on. And yeah. I imagine with someone like Ed Sheeran, you know, he's probably more in control because it's his tour, right? And so you're kind of, you know, you're opening and doing the kind of thing. Yeah. So you're sort of, maybe that sort of OCD, that sort of obsessive compulsive sort of where you have to be in control steps in. Does, is it something like that you think or no? Um, I think... Is that me really reading into it deeply? And it's just nothing to do with that. It's more like, uh, it does happen on my own tour as well at moments. It'll, uh, But it's really stupid, tiny little things that like, I, I'm almost a, would be embarrassed to say them because people would be like, that's like, you sound like a diva, you know, but when no, I started, on, you, you don't sound like a diva at all. This is this, this is, it'll be like, I don't know. It'll be like, for example, I have ginger shots in my dressing room. Right. Yeah. And they're just something that like psychologically, I think helped me, help me feel good about my voice. They just like, I don't know. I like having them there. And of course there's a, enough for, there's maybe like five and there might be a team of eight or whatever. And they're mainly just for me to drink or whatever. And obviously other people can have them as well, but sometimes I'll, come in and they'll all be gone and I'll just be like well, like the amount of yeah, times you, you that sound people like have, a diva <laughs> you know it, it, I do I know it sounds bad no, but it'll just be like a ritual, little it's thing yeah, it'd be a little thing that'll piss me off being like everyone knows the ginger shots are for me somebody would have gone and seen the last one and that's the way that I was raised if my brother ate the last thing on the kitchen table at breakfast my parents would be like you don't eat the last croissant before asking, has everybody had one or whatever, you know? So when I come yeah. into like my dressing room and the people around and I never know who it is. So then it pisses me off because I'm like, it, I'm annoyed that someone will have taken something and not considered not just me, but everyone else and just seen, you just don't take the last one of An anything. An element you know? of kindness is coming where you're just like, hang on a second. This is, people know this is my ritual, but also no one's like offering anything around. It's more, you know, we're all a team here. Yeah, everyone should be talking to each other. Everyone should be like, Guys, it's the last ginger shot. Does anyone want it or whatever? And using ginger shots as a really bad, bad example. But I get it. And that's not at all what happened on this Ed thing. It was a much bigger deal, bigger situation. Um, what happened in that context is I was probably 30 meters away from the stage when the show and the song started and I had to run and get up these stairs in time. And I was like, I don't even know where I'm going. So that was like what threw me off of that, you know? But yeah. it are, sometimes little things can just distract you and you're like stressed and then it's like, a minute before stage and you're going on and you're like, you know when something annoys you totally. just a little bit and you're like, why am I even thinking about like a ginger shot? Like it doesn't matter, but it's hard to like get it out of your mind sometimes in those high pressure situations. I think what it is though sometimes is when you have a blueprint of how something's going to go yeah. and you've had that, you know, 10 years old dreaming of this moment or this feeling or this, here we go. And you're then doing it and the blueprint doesn't go exactly to what you want it to yeah. go. Anything can put you off. Yeah. You're like, ah, oh God, I didn't do that or didn't do this. Yeah, I, 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 you know, it's so, so lame, but I, I, I played a lot of rugby when I was a kid, right? Yeah. And I loved it more than anything in the entire world. And I was top try scorer and we were playing the last game and we were going to be unbeaten again for another season. And 
I got past the ball and I dropped the ball over the line, didn't score the try. We won the game and whatever, but because of that, and we had an unbeaten season, we never lost a game in the whole season, but because of that one moment of dropping the ball ruined everything for me. Oh, yeah. And still to this day, oh my God. I, I, was, I was like 16, like, what does it, like it's yeah. going to do nothing for my life. But still to this day, if I think about it, I go, ah, oh, it's annoying that, I, yeah. that one, happened. One thing that I noticed, like, I was trying to explain it to my girlfriend and, and she's a personal trainer. And when she comes on tour, she really like tries to get me to exercise as much as possible. And we were actually, I think we were at the O2, it was maybe on the second night or this could have even been the first night. And she was getting me to do, we were, we were working out and whatever. And then she was getting me like in between some sort of thing. She was like, oh, while you have a break, do some like press ups. And I was like, I don't want to do too much like arm exercise because I'd be worried that, you know, when sometimes when you do, your arms are a bit shaky, you can't mm. like hold them up or whatever. And then she was like, they won't be though, it's fine. Like, it's not going to be too much that that it won't be. And I was like, I know that you think that, and that's probably true, but I can't have the th possible thought in my mind yeah. when I'm going out into arena, and these are my first times ever playing arenas. I just don't want the thought in the back of my mind of what if I go out and I try to lift my arms or they're like a bit shaky at the piano or something. And I'm like... And she was like, but they won't be, trust me. She was yeah, like, I don't get why you don't trust me. And I'm like, I do trust you, but I just can't even have a 1% chance thought because it's more about the thought in my mind True. than actually, if my hands were a bit shaky or my arms are shaky, it wouldn't actually affect really my playing probably, but it's having a thought that I don't need to have that is taking up space before I want to just go and like have fun. And, and, you know, and it's gotten better now. Like now I've managed to be able to, uh, actually from being on tour with Ed, I've really managed to realize that like, like Ed would be talking to me up until the minute before he goes on stage and someone would be like, Ed, you got one minute. And he'd be like, cool, let me just change my shoes. And he'd be like, I'll see you after. Shut up. And in that, <laughs> that moment, casual? yeah, that casual, like so casual, just change the shoes. And in that moment, I was like, okay, I'm good at not being nervous, but now I need to learn to not be like too like ritualed before. And I wasn't that ritual, but everyone everyone tells you you should be because at every like single interview, everything, people are like, so what are your like pre-show rituals? What do you do? What gets you in the zone? So then you start thinking like, I was always like, I don't really have anything. Okay, I should start getting some things. I should start playing some music to pump me up. I should do this, I should do that. Doesn't that create anxiety though? That might, like, As a performer, because then you go, shit, I haven't had my piece of dark chocolate at yeah, yeah. 10 to 6, so now I'm freaking out. You exactly. Know? Like exactly. the ginger show, so it creates anxiety almost, yeah. right? And when I saw that with Ed, how chilled he was, it was, and I, and I, and I was like, of course, after 10 or 15 years, you get to that point. But I just saw that and immediately is what the first thing I noticed. I was like, he is having dinner with his mates. He's it, he's chatting to me right up until the moment, whatever it is. And he's just like going out. And like I try, have tried to just adapt that now, like completely. And and now it's just like I found it so much easier. Now I'm just like, what? Well, it doesn't matter what I'm doing up until I don't want to do something annoying. Like if they're mm. like, oh, you've got like a radio interview, I'd be like, okay, well, I'm not going to do that in my 15 minutes before stage because I'm like, <laughs> yeah, just going to be much. like, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, too yeah, much. That's like, way too much. You know, but I'll, I'll be, I'm chill to like play some games, like do whatever. And if it's like, yeah, here's your pack, you go one minute, like that's totally fine with me now. If anything, it's super nice to just be distracted. What it, What is it when you get the call up to do something with Ed Sheeran, what, what does that feel like? How does that even happen? Um, so... The first instance is that I I'll just get a call from my manager and she'll say she was like guess who you're guess who's asked you to open up for you to open up for them on tour dude that's wild yeah and I'm just like at home in my apartment and and I think my manager was actually at a show in the West End and in the interval she got a call and um, I'm just like guessing first of all and everyone I'm guessing she's like bigger and she's like bigger bigger and I'm like how do I get much bigger and eventually I'm like. Ed Sheeran and like even though I knew he was already on a tour and he'd had like support acts for all of these dates and like I was like he doesn't have another tour but it was like a tour that hadn't been announced just yeah. this little mini one and uh, she was like yeah and I was like no way like fuck in my mind Hell. I'm like I cannot that's not happening I was like that's gonna get up until like the day I went like genuinely up until the day we drove into the first stage or first arena in Manchester, I, I was like, this is going to get taken away from us. Like, this is going to be, yeah. like, it's going to be like, oh, sorry, actually it's cancelled or, oh, Ed, Ed changed his mind. And then on the other end, when I meet Ed and we talk, from his side, it was basically like, I think he was planning this new tour where he was going to be performing that new album. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, you know, 
in a in a quick version I guess he had been hearing my music like all the time regularly on the radio and stuff like that and had um probably liked it or whatever and I think but he know, must have right he must have seen something in the way you perform the way you sing the way you write whatever it is that he was like that's what I want yeah I mean I, I I like his quick story was like he was like yeah man like we were playing this tour and they were like who do you want to open up and your song was playing on the radio and he was like I want that guy and it was like that was kind of his quick story but then obviously we spoke more and and um from what I gather he had probably been seeing me for a while or whatever um but uh, just insane like it's insane because something you dream of your whole life as like a singer songwriter first songs I ever learned in guitar were Ed Sheeran songs first songs I was singing covering songs I was trying to like copy would have been Ed Sheeran songs when I first started writing back in the day and like and then you see people go on tour with him and you're like wow like how do you become that person that Ed Sheeran chooses to go on tour with him that's all like and then one day you're that person that he chooses and you're like, no, that's not real. You know, and it still doesn't feel real today. Like, I still think it's very weird. Like, it's crazy. How much do you believe in manifestation and, and that side of things? I fully believe, yeah. 100%. Well, talk to me why, because you've experienced it. Yeah, with like everything in my life. I think I've experienced it. everything in my career and my life. And I think, um, I think there's some, it's, I don't think it's magic. Maybe it is, I don't know. But I think it's like, whether it puts you in the right place or the right situation or it makes you work in the right mindset. But like sometimes it does things that are just mysterious and you're like, I don't understand how I'm here. Um, like what? What has happened to you? We've gone like, I, this, like part of, I, I suppose that dreaming when you were 10 years old and then yeah. suddenly you're feeling it. You're like, this is what. Yeah, that's I, like manifestation for sure. Like in your dreams and stuff. Like I think like so many things in my life, um, even a number one album, I, I used to go to bed like every night being like, like I'm so grateful for my number one album, and then like a few months later, I have a number one album, and like. Uh, Wait, hang on. So you would go to bed every night, say affirmations at night, being like, "Yeah, I'm so happy for." So not even not even speaking into existence, you're just saying what's already here. Yeah, because I believe that like all we have is like the the present moment is the real moment, and like that's you know. But we won't get into chats about the science of time. But like, I, yeah. <laughs> I just think well, about like... Oh, that's exactly where I wanted to get to. <laughs> I think like when you're talking about it as if you have it and it's already there, that's how you can get it to come to you. It's the way that I find it the easiest anyway. Everyone has their own ways and there's no right way to do it. But for me, it just makes me feel good and it makes me believe in myself. And I remember the biggest thing was I started... As a kid, I did law, I practiced the law of attraction without knowing. As a kid, I always believed in myself, no matter what. I never, ever, ever doubted myself. And at the time, I was doing a lot of classical music or I'd be doing like little television auditions and stuff. Um, and classical music is a lot of competitions, like very high level competitions. Yeah, because you, you were you, you trained in a flute, then the flute, yeah. right? Yeah. And when I was a kid, I, I did loads of competitions. I could have been, I think I did say, let's talk like maybe three, four or five years in a row. I did maybe when I was 10, I did like under 13s. When I was uh, 11, I did under 16s. When I was 12, I did like degree and master students competitions. And I won every single one of them, but I never questioned whether I would. I always just believed. And it's not because I was like, oh, I'm the best. I was just like, I'm going to do the best that I can possibly do. I'm going to play as well as I can. And I never questioned that I would like do badly, like not even do badly as a result. I just never thought, Oh, I hope I don't perform badly. I just always believed in myself so much and believed in the music and believed in the practice that I put in. And, um, and How much practice did you put in? A lot of practice. I mean, classical music is Is this driven is like, from your mom? Yeah, definitely, yeah. Driven from my mom, but like always just like, if you want to do this, this is what you have to do, you know, not like because, forcefully driven. Yeah, which is great because I would, you know, it's sort of the, um, you know, gr growing up, you know, when I was growing up, the to be to be fully invested into playing classical music i would say is unique yeah right you know and because normally it's you're invested in things which are pointless like i don't know yeah. uh, or watching football or whatever it is yeah. and that's what you'll do and so then but you want to be a footballer because we see these things and we see exciting you know what yeah. you're passionate about is music and classical music and going into these competitions and and doing that and and I imagine and you're also then going into competitions against older people so you're not even mixing with your own age group quite yeah. a lot of the time. I think I just like I loved the sense of competition and I also loved that well I was also quite very grown up for my age and mature from like stuff in my childhood and things 
but yeah, I think I just like, it was just the way, like what me and my mom and my brother, we did. And it was just what we loved. And like, I found it really fun. It was the challenge every year. There was the competition. We come back around different competitions and stuff. Um, and I don't necessarily like competition, but I just loved performing. I loved the challenge. I knew that was what I was good at was performing. Um, and I was where I was the best, you know, even where, even if it was in the class or the classroom, I might not have necessarily performed the best, but when I got on stage and as what my mom always said, she was like, no matter how much I tried to get Keen to perfect things in the classroom or in the lessons or whatever, I just had to trust like when he gets on stage, it'll, he'll smash it and it'll be like so different. And that's always the ability that I had was just to be the best version of myself on stage, which is very, very weird. weird. Yeah. yeah. It's very strange. What um, is that? But you look, and maybe you, you don't want to go into it. And I, I fully appreciate if you don't want to, but where you said, you know, you had to, you, you, you sort of matured rather quickly and you have this, where does that come from? What in childhood? <laughs> uh, so, well, my dad was very like abusive with me and my brother and really? with my mom, obviously. Um, and I think from having that sort of, obviously having a, that was like, I was quite young. I was probably like maybe five or six and my brother was like eight or nine and it lasted a, like a, a really long time. And then getting out of it took a really, really long time. Um, so obviously when you're like a kid and you're experiencing both like physical and sexual abuse, it's like very, you have to grow up super fast because all the conversations are very grown up. Suddenly you're talking to therapists and, and counselors and professionals and people who are asking you questions and you have to explain things and then you have to learn things about yourself and your, your mom has to have conversations with you that she probably shouldn't have with you for another 10 years. And, and as you grow older, you have to grow even faster with all that. So I think we grew up extremely fast um, and our like sort of childhood and our innocence was basically just like immediately killed. And I remember like everyone around us was like suddenly like a kid and me and my brother were like, this is so weird. And my mom even would have to be like, look, you have to be careful how you speak, what you do, how you like act because everyone around you is still like a kid living in Disneyland and you're not, you know what the like the planet is like. And, and it was like, you as a kid you're just like div adapting or whatever you know and you're you're learning and and you have all these like strange conversations of like you know consent and stuff like that like really young mm -hmm. and you have the conversations like of you know for example for me if i was ever to be in a situation where someone accused me of non-consent or something i'd probably immediately just be convicted because of my history of being abused as a kid a judge would just be like well, that's what, you know, that's what they tell you as a kid. They're just like, make sure that you never are like, that you ask yes like a million times. Otherwise, mm -hmm. a judge will look at your file and be like, oh, well, his dad abused him, so he's probably a, a weirdo. So you grow up thinking like wow. all these things. And so you just change, you just grow up so fast because you're like having these crazy conversations when some other kids don't even know what sex is or no, you know, yeah. like don't understand any of this stuff. Um, and that obviously you see your mother being affected, like, I've seen my mom in, you know, so many difficult stages and, and, and stuff in, in life and you see the emotion there and you start carrying around emotion. And, and so then when it comes to like playing music, it's like the, it just floods out of you because it's like the only way you can get that emotion out as well at that age. Um, and probably still now it's like how I get any of that out and process any like emotions to that kind of level. So yeah, you, you just like you kind of grow up and then that maturity is like in your, in your music for a long time and, and mm. whatever. Um, Ken, well, I, you know what that is? <clears throat> I'm so sorry. That is a thing. No person should ever experience ever. And it's amazing that you are, are open enough to, to discuss it. Mm. Cause I just think, especially, you know, I mean, it's a typical thing we talk about men typically not be able to talk about anything, but be able yeah. to do that and, and go through it and process it and understand it. And, but then also have this inner confidence as well within yourself, that's unbelievable. Because nice. it is, it's amazing, it's incredible because one would suggest, as you said about the judge, you know, was just that it would affect so many people in so many different ways. Yeah. But you, your brother and your mom managed to hold it together. Hmm. And that is, uh, I mean, I applaud your mother, I applaud you, I applaud your, your brother, people like that, that's insane. Thank you. And so when you go through something horrendous like that, and as you said, it's the, the beginning, the middle and the after, Therapy, you do, you, you, your innocence is shattered. Yeah. And, and that is, 
you know, not what any child should ever have. How do you then come out of it? How do you work your way out of things like that? I think like I was very lucky that my mom was very like sort of, I think she just knew what to do or how to, she prioritized me and my brother first and foremost. She didn't really take care of herself. She was like, I got to take care of my kids, protect them. And, um, and she just put us straight away in therapy. Like, so every week I went to therapy when I was in primary school, secondary school. So how um, old is that? What age would you have been? Probably from like, I don't know, it could have been like seven years old or wow. whatever, or yeah. eight, all the way through to, you know, I was doing therapy when I was 18, 19, 20. Mm -hmm. um, and that was like every week and every week I would, you know, a lot of the time I would nip out of school and then go back. But many times we didn't go back to school because it was just too much. Like you'd come out of therapy and you can't go back to school. Like, so like that was like a regular Monday for me was just like get pulled out of school to go like to family therapy. And then, and then just like my mom would have to bring us somewhere to do something that would like make distract us and make us happy again. And, but the therapy helped so much. Like, obviously it was unbelievable. And I think without that, we wouldn't have gotten out of there, but also without like family or like my mom's French family going to France, uh, friends, we had such amazing friends around us who, who housed us for, for times when we, when we didn't have anywhere to live, who took care of us, who provided us with, with money, with just things that, you know, like without friends, we wouldn't, like my mom wouldn't have made it through. Um, and then my mom was amazing and she was obviously extremely talented. So her talent allowed her to work and be able to provide for her two kids. And, um, and then my stepdad came along as well. And he just, he was there to like be the rock for my mom and help us all in that way as well. Um, and music obviously was like a super important thing that just was like this thing that bonded us and this therapy and this, uh, thing that also allowed us to escape and get out and travel the world and like get mm. scholarships to schools and all this kind of stuff and kind of allowed us to just create a, a life, the, the life that we kind of had. And although it had this like really dark side, it also had a really positive side always at the same time. Um, what, what, what is that? I, I, I always got told something which I sort of truly believe is that when, when a, a door shuts, look for a window. Because there's always a window open. So if something terrible happens or an opportunity occurs or something awful like that yeah. happens, there's always something beyond it that's going to be better. Yeah. And you just have to get through these moments in order to get there. Yeah. Do, you, do, you, do you sort of, having gone through something like that, do you sort of really believe in in that if you, you get on this road and you push through, better things would come? Yeah, I think like we lived in a permanent sort of state of an attitude of like gratefulness through all of that, no matter how hard it was, my mom was always saying, uh, I remember like how much she would say it, like things could be worse. She would just always remind us. And she'd make stupid examples and I, I won't list the examples, but she would just list, she was like, things could be worse. We could be, and she would just make something up and they would just make you laugh and be like, geez, yeah, like, thank God. Like that's, that's not the situation. And like, and, in, and then suddenly your life seems amazing. And, you know, so I think it's like, there's all different ways to see that. And I think just like your analogy of there's, when a door closes, there's always a window open. And like, I think that was our way of seeing that. My mom would just constantly remind us, like, there is always people going through worse, no matter like what it is. And, um, and that was definitely something that I kind of held on to like my whole life, no matter what, I just always thought of that, that like, it could be worse. And mm. so take it as the glass half full, you know? Oh, okay. I thank you for sharing that. Honestly, dude, it's, it's it's just, I it, it must be hard to talk about things like that. I can only imagine. But you know, you 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 process you go through because then what is your mother's obviously a rock star because you <laughs> then get this scholarship to go to London, yeah. the Royal Academy of Music in London. That must be this moment which is like, oh my god, okay. And you you leave Ireland, you're heading to London, nervous, excited. What are the feelings when something like that happens? So actually the way that it happened first is I went, I left Ireland before that because I went to another music school before the academy. I went to a boarding school called Wells Cathedral School, which is in Somerset. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the first, that was my first time getting out of Ireland. I went there on a scholarship and that was to do A-levels, specializing in music um, and performance and stuff. And that was like, being able to do that, first of all, was like incredible and I was, all I wanted to do was to get out of Ireland for yeah. so long. Okay. For, for all the reasons we spoke about. Right? Exactly. And I found it so, I like, I hated being in Ireland, I hated living there. I had such a bad relationship with Ireland in so many ways. 
Really? I had like I had good relationship as well. Yeah. But there were so many things that all I wanted to do was leave and so many of our problems that we had whilst living there would have been solved if we could have just left, but we couldn't leave. My mom couldn't leave the country with me and my brother and all that. So it felt why, like So why couldn't she leave? Because my dad wouldn't let us. He would have had to give permission for us to, to leave the country and stuff like that. So like and he would not and never allow that. Um, so we couldn't leave the country, like move somewhere else, go to France, be with our family. So we were stuck there, like no matter until I would turn 18 one day or my brother, or whatever. Um, so leaving was like this huge, like relief. And even for my mom to see her kids go and just escape and go and be happy somewhere else. Um, and so I went, I went to boarding school. And then from there I went on and I went to the Royal Academy, which was obviously like a dream come true, something that I, you know, wanted to achieve my whole life. Uh, and like moving to London alone was like crazy and just like I remember walking around London and being like how am I in London like this is insane um but it was because that's was when all those emotions coming you're like oh my god I'm here now yeah it's crazy it's such a crazy city to move to and I, I do remember like how I felt walking around and stuff but then it was like I found it very hard then like I loved living here but it was so different to to like living in Ireland and to even Irish people you know um, because there's so much more like of an industry and like it's like a place where like like not like Ireland doesn't especially back then it didn't have like a music industry it doesn't have anything like that, like that. so making friends is so easy because you just go up to anyone who's a musician or whatever and you're just like hey like you want to be mates you want to play some songs you want to do some gigs or form a band and everyone's like yeah sure you go up to a busker it's the same thing but in London, it was so different, you know, it was very like wait so, so in London so people are much more sta I mean that's the yeah. obvious thing to understand so Really? So it, it, it's basically London is a unfriendly city in a lot of ways. It was quite unfriendly. Yeah. And like, it's not necessarily like if you get to know people, then they can be very friendly and stuff, but it, it didn't feel very welcoming. It didn't feel very like, you know, collaborative, collaborative. No, I was here for years and no one wanted to be, no one wanted to be friends. No one wanted to make music or hang out or, or just like, and I was so like, that's so weird. I thought I would move here, meet a bunch of songwriters and singers and we'd all kind of do our thing and be friends and like, yeah. you know, and it just was not like that, like at all. And I still probably don't really have any friends that are like close, close friends mm. that were through sort of the industry in that way, really. Um, that's that's strange because you would feel that people on the same pathway would connect, but actually maybe you're, it's seen as competition. I think that's probably maybe what it was, seen as competition, but... Um, I don't know what it is. I'd love to know, to be honest, but I, it was just, I'd never experienced that in my life. And when I encountered it, I was like, what the hell? Like, what is this? This is so weird. Why don't people just want to play and just do yeah, what? Connect as humans and yeah. play music and have fun. That's all I understood. But then I started to think like, maybe it's because there's a music industry and it's like, everyone's on like a ladder at some sort of place. And if you're not in the same place, it's like, you're not welcome or uh, it's a social status thing. Maybe. Exactly, yeah. There was a whole other... And there's it doesn't exist in Ireland. Like, it's not... And if you are of that status, you don't really usually tend to live in Ireland or, like, it's just not... There isn't really that kind of thing. So it was especially, like, go back, whatever, 10 years ago. So five years ago, it was like... So it's just really weird to sort of see that. It's a shock to the system, I imagine, because I, I, have, I have a few Irish friends, right? And... Um, and especially we have a, a one guy called Ryan who's also a performer, an amazing performer, he's amazing. And well, I used to go on holiday with my friend Georgie and Ryan used to come and all these things. And what we would do every evening, he would get around the piano and everyone was singing instruments and everything would come out. And it was this hugely sort of like, um, like ensemble that we all became. It was amazing. Yeah. And I see it with, you know, my friend's wife is Irish and I see it's always family. Yeah. Everyone is always there. It doesn't matter if your brother, or co their third cousin was staying in the house at like one yeah. time. Yeah. Like that is, I, I, it's not so much a uh, English thing. Yeah. I remember it's moving. strange, right? For when I went to boarding school, I remember uh, going to a house party. I was in a music boarding school, oh, right? Gosh. Everyone were like specialists, like elite <laughs> yeah. classical music players who also played all kinds of stuff. I went to a first big house party and like, I was like, oh, should I bring my guitar? And everyone was like, why would you bring your guitar to a house party, you loser? And I was just like, because obviously we're going to have a jam session. Like, I was so confused because yeah. every single party, night out, anything I'd ever had my whole life would end up in a friend's house. 
We'd all whip out like guitars, instruments, cajones. Even people who weren't musicians, they'd be singing a song. You pass the guitar to your mate who's like, you know, I even think about, like, about it now. Like my best friend who's like, does all my content, videography and stuff. Like when we have a, a session, everyone passes Nathan the guitar and he sings like one of his favorite songs and it like, everyone tears up and it's like beautiful. And like, everyone's like, what the hell? Like he can sing. And it's like, yeah. And also can pretty much like everybody else in Ireland, like, Everyone just whips out a song. Everyone sings yeah. together. People are doing harmonies. So I, like when I moved to a music school, I was like, yeah, we're going to have a, a jam sesh in the house. And everyone's just like, not at all. Like that's, an, and I was what? like. That's, what? That's, that's weird to me as well. Yeah, it's amazing. I have a, I have a friend of mine who um, he, he was married to a, an Irish guy. And he said, he was so funny. He had, he, they had their wedding. And it was amazing. Anyway. They went home after the wedding and he got back and he was so tired. And anyway, he shut the door and there was the ring of the door. He looked out. He was like, who is it? And it was the whole, th- whole guest and they had brought basically a whole band. <laughs> yeah. It was like a trombone. And, like, and, 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 they'd all, and, and they just, that's what it was. And they were yeah. just singing together yeah. and having a great, that's the, but that's what life should be like. Yeah, it is what life should be like. And it it's strange be. that it, basically what it is, is that it, we've suddenly got this sort of status awkwardness yeah. that we are socially awkward we 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 so desperate to fit in yeah that we then don't do what we love to do because that's not cool yeah it's why a, would you bring a guitar yeah. we're not going to do that are you kidding me yeah it's so sad because it's so fun and beautiful and that's all that's like those are the moments that are important those are the moments that actually you remember and that matter and like it's not the even the successes and the achievements like it's the moments you have within that journey like jam sessions and little spontaneous like it's those things and life is all supposed to be about that and it's supposed to be connecting and and collaborating and just like humans just like connecting on on whatever level and like music is like one of the best ways to do that and so yeah I wish just the world was more like that and like more places had that sort of environment and like but it's I don't know it's yeah there's definitely like a change that needs to happen I suppose it's it's funny though because from your experience of doing all of those you know singing and bringing a guitar to after parties and playing music that probably gives you the confidence to do what you do is when you make these amazing videos yeah. that you just sing in public yeah and explain that so what because you i know I, you know you've done all these videos now on social media and they have gone absolutely viral mm. to the point where you've appeared on the late late show uh you've done you i'd see you did something with good morning america was, yeah it was insane yeah, so wh- where did this idea come from to basically busk in the street and create magic for these people around you so i think it stems because when i was a kid or a teenager or whatever like me and my friends we just wanted to pull pranks and do stupid youtube videos and like do you remember the Janoskians? Do you remember those yeah, guys? Yeah, I do. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, like sort of like Impractical Jokers, stuff like that, yeah. you know? Um, and it was like uh, just all these, like there was like YouTube groups where they were just a bunch of friends and they would just make videos of doing the craziest stupid public pranks. And I always loved that. And me and my friends would do it for no reason. We wouldn't even film it. We would just like test each other and be like, I dare you to go into that shop and try to do this or whatever. Or, like let's like go into uh, McDonald's and let's do a full wrap for our order. You know, we're just going to wrap the order. And like, we wouldn't even film it. You know, we would just like do these things because it was funny and we thought it was like fun. Um, and so I always had like an addiction to that. And I loved like sort of these just pranks, these like public prank ideas because it's just funny to see people's reactions. Um, and then I, I wrote the song called I'll Be Waiting and it had come out. Yeah. And... I had had a successful song called Offer You before that. And then this is the next song. And I was like, well, there's no way it's going to be as successful as Offer You. Um, because it, Offer You was about 10, 100 times as successful as anything I had before. Um, and, uh, you know, you're just thinking of ways to promote. And we were basically doing this like a uh, live choir version of the song, uh, like a full scale version, like professionally filmed or recorded for YouTube as like a, you know, Keen to Crow, I'll be waiting live with yeah. choir at yeah, yeah, some yeah. place. Um, and we went to Manchester to do it because that's where the location was in this abandoned swimming pool. And I was on the phone to my best friend, Nathan, who I do all the content with, who would have been one of my best friends from back in the day when we would do these stupid videos. And I don't know whether it was because I was on the phone to him or something in the back of my mind, but like, I was just, he was like, yeah, so we're going up and we've got the rehearsals of the choir and then we're going to film the the YouTube thing and whatever. Um, and... 
And then I was like, wait, so like we fully have like a whole choir like the day before. And he was like, yeah. And I was like, I wonder could we like after we've rehearsed the song, could we just like go to like some public random places? And like my idea was like, I'm going to, I'm just going to start singing and everyone would think I'm like really weird and be like, why is that guy? What a loser. Like stop singing. You know, like what are you doing? And then these people who are dressed as like normal people would somehow like filter in and then just start singing as like a choir and everyone would be like, what the hell? Like I'm really not expected. And then we were just like, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. Um, and then I kind of, I kind of like forgot a little bit that we were doing it and then we went and then it was like, oh yeah, we were doing that, that like, public prank thing okay let's go out and we just spent a whole like evening kind of just running around manchester with this choir that i just met and started so working good. with and we just like filmed some of these pranks and i remember we looked at the footage and like we were like yeah maybe one of them is usable like i love you running around with a choir yeah just <laughs> running around with a choir and we had all these crazy moments like we walked past a guy who was busking singing one of my songs and we were just like i first of all i was like that's he was singing i'll be waiting which wasn't even known at that point but he probably found it because he knew my other song, which had become known. Just so he, randomly you walk past him. Yeah, we randomly walk past him. And like anyone in their sane mind would have seen me and would have sang my famous song. But this kid somehow sang my new song. I guess he was a fan, so he knew the new song, which was I'll Be Waiting, yeah. which I was just out doing these videos for. And he didn't know that I was with a choir. So in my mind, I'm turning around. I'm like, oh my God. And like my friend instantly turns as he's filming on his phone. Nathan starts filming. And like, I'm thinking to myself, like, I'm not even like, let alone that someone's singing my song in the middle of the street. But what shocked me wasn't even that. I was like, this guy doesn't know that first of all, I'm going to come over and join him, but that all of these people around are a choir that are going to start singing. And so I was like, oh my God, I get to the surprise, this guy with a choir. And so like all this crazy stuff happened in this day. So and much excitement within that. As yeah. you're going to do it, like, oh my God, this is going to be great. And it was, I think like five maybe six videos we got out of that day and all those i think they what probably, views did they hit on on social media i think they i think probably three or four of them like a hundred million views each on just like tiktok alone um and then that is wild amount yeah and then the rest of them so i think it i think neared a billion from one day of just filming these videos with a choir. and then we did loads more different locations around the world um but it was just like who would have thought you know like just some Hilarious pop-up choir video. Billion views. Yeah, it's crazy. It's insane. I remember we were just like, we posted the first video and we were like, oh my God. And it was just started like 20 million, 30 million, 50 million. And we were like, let's post it. Let's let's try piece another one together. Posted it. It went even bigger. Another one, it went even bigger. And then eventually it was just like, just took over. What do you think the secret is to making a sort of viral video like that? Is I there know. no secret sauce? There is, there's like the way that you edit it, obviously. Sure, I get that. Um, but element, so someone listening now, someone who wants to get into the music industry, right? And someone yeah. who is a, a, like a hugely talented performer who's getting rejections and, and isn't Because what I truly believe about social media is it gives you this platform yeah. to get your stuff out there, yeah. right? And so if you, if you had to give someone advice on how to get their song out there on social media, would you say creating a video which does something different like that? Yeah, doing something engaging, doing something. I think the reason, like, it's something engaging. There's obviously the whole, like, the first three seconds needs to be blah, blah, blah. Like, I don't follow any of those rules. We just try to make something that's engaging. And, but even that, we weren't thinking. I was just like, what's something that fun? I, ac I actually thought, I think the idea came because I thought to myself, what would I, what would stop me uh, if I was scrolling? And I would be like, whoa, like, what's happening here? Like, I'm going to watch this, you know? Something outrageous. I was like, a choir in a tiny cafe that's pretty outrageous i don't know so it's like that's what i thought i was like outrageous things stop me things that are like a bit like mad a bit like public things and but i also one thing that i struggled with before this and i had you know a lot of songs and i was trying to figure out how to promote them and i was successful enough on tiktok but not with like promoting my own music and stuff and i i just couldn't figure it out and the thing that i hated and i still to this day hate and i still do it sometimes um, because sometimes it's nice and it's easier for people to digest it and whatever, is when you write a song that's so personal and means so much to you and has like so much depth and then you have to just do the classic thing that everyone does. Like, 
here's a, here's the biggest breaker song I ever wrote. And then they play it. They're like, here's a song I wrote about like send it to your ex. And I'm like, no, I can't tell you in five seconds before I press play what my song is about. And I found that so tough and like demoralizing and soul crushing. And I was like, how about what I do has nothing to do with the song? It's just a funny video of me singing with a choir, you know, like it was that kind of thing. And like, I think I was just so you're lucky. You're not following logic. You're going against logic, which I think is a really great way to yeah. stand out from the crowd. It just detached like the meaning. I didn't have to do something about like, here's me telling you about the meaning of the song in 10 seconds and then playing it for you to try and engage you in the meaning. I'm just going to do something else that engages you to the song, like a beautiful choir or the way that we're performing or whatever. Um, but I think the biggest thing is like, and it's everyone says it and it's really hard to figure it out, but it's just try do something original. Try be yourself, like do something that you want to do. And like, everyone's like, oh, like now everyone's like, oh, flash mobs. I didn't even think about it as a flash mob. Like I didn't really like, I wasn't, I was just thinking it was a prank. Now people are like, oh, you do these flash mobs. I'm like, yeah, I guess it's a flash mob. Um, and flash mobs are not, you know, I didn't come up with a new concept. I'm not like, oh, I'm so original. Like so people would be like, flash mobs aren't original. But like, I guess no one was doing them at that point anymore. Like it, no one was doing them on TikTok, mm. not in that way. And from the kind of point of view that I was doing them as like this kind of prank, I don't know. But it was like, and I, it was more that I was just trying to find something that I actually enjoyed doing. I didn't enjoy sitting in my car like everyone else being like, there's nothing against that. If that's how you like to play and sing and your type of way of of, of connecting with your audience. But it, it didn't feel authentic to me. Mm. And when I had this idea of flash mob, I was like, that is authentic to me. Pulling a really stupid prank and embarrassing myself, making myself look stupid at the start of the video because I'm singing and everyone's like, what? who is this guy? Like, that's what I love. I like that kind of stuff. I like not taking it too seriously and just having a bit of a laugh. Because um, if we have to take it seriously, it's like, it's it's much more deep. It's much more yeah. like... And then it becomes almost work rather than doing something that you love. But then do you think with your album Victory that was number one in Ireland, number one in the UK, do you think that the success of social media helped that as well? Well, yeah. I mean, it wouldn't have even made it. You don't album. think it would have made anything? I, I wouldn't have even been in the position to make an album if I hadn't had that success from the okay. help of social media. You have to have a certain following and people who will buy an album and... You know, it's like you had. I had those two successful songs, and at that point, it's like, okay, now you're gonna, you can make an album. Like we want an album. Like let's do this. And that's my dream is to make an album, and let alone to have a number one album. So when you get a number one album, yeah, and bring you back to that kid who's lying in bed having these dreams, how does it make you feel when you suddenly find out, shit, I'm number one? I don't even know. Like I was like shouting and crying and just like. It's unbelievable. It's like the most, it's like a feeling that like you, I couldn't, there was no, I didn't even know what to do. I was like, just, oh my God. And, and I think you'll understand this. There's not a lot of things that happen in your career that are huge goals that actually make you feel just like, like screaming, crying, insane. You know, like the goals that you think would make you feel that way. They don't. Like when I signed a record deal, it was the pandemic and I was just like, I was like, the lead up to it, I was like, this is insane. But I was so afraid that it would slip away. But like the battle to be number one and the fact that I really didn't even, I didn't know up until the hour that the result came out. Like I didn't know. A lot of people find out before. Yeah. But it was like so close and so hard and we pushed so much. And like, I'm so grateful to the fans that bought the album who like managed to somehow get us there. It was just like, we touched down on a plane at Boardmasters. We got a text from... Um, someone who works at the label that we're very close with and she was you know detrimental obviously to the whole thing and she sent a, a, a message saying do you want a text or a call and we were like this is not good news and I was like okay here we go and like even though my whole mindset was like I've got it I'm gonna yeah, be, yeah, I'm, yeah, number, yeah. I'm gonna be number one but like I didn't think I was really but I was trying <laughs> to like manifest it yeah. and she calls and she's bawling crying on the phone and I'm like oh no she's like crying because she doesn't want to deliver the bad news and it's it's my manager my best friend me and my girlfriend all sitting in a row and the flight just touches down in boardmasters and then she's like we did it and we're just like what? <sighs> even like just remembering the moment like i was yeah. just in tears like i couldn't believe it like i just i couldn't i couldn't believe it i was like i can't believe i have a number one album in the uk and ireland like it's insane like it was just insane i'm still when i think about it i'm like 
I, so insane. You deserve all the success, though. Thank you so much. You, 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 you do. You know, I, I, I heard you perform. You know, I heard you lucky enough to hear you perform live, and it's, it's. Thank you. It's unbelievable. <laughs> Thank you very much. And the fact having gone through what you have been through, you get out the other side, and then you're doing what you're doing now. It's a true story of success. Thank you. And and I only truly believe it's going to keep going up and up and up. So, you know, so where are you heading to next? So you, you finished the recording today. Are you off then performing somewhere else soon as well? Um, are you saying after this, right? Well, now? not after this, but like where are you, where are you performing next? Uh, my next performance is actually for the National Television Awards tomorrow. I'm there. Oh, sick. Well, I'll see you there. I'll are be performing there, which I have rehearsals for after this. Um, I'm gonna shout, yeah, can I? <laughs> That's amazing, dude. Yeah, so it it's, cool. it's just now, I, I feel like once the tumbleweed gets going, yeah, it doesn't seem to stop, right? I mean, that's what it looks like on the outside, yeah. <laughs> but as you know yourself, it's like the tumbleweed doesn't go if you don't keep pushing it as well, you can, know. Can I ask before you go, and again, I wanted this because I'm sure someone listening to you right now is a huge fan and they probably want to get into the industry as well and they want to, sorry. Is there a is there a method to writing a good song, a hit song? That's such a good question. Like it's really, really good question. Um, I think there's a there is a method to writing a pretty good song, like a like in 70, 80 percent or pretty good song. And I could probably write you 10, 20, 30, 100 in a row now without really having to try to write you one of those. But to write something that's like the hit, the one that like, that's, I think is just magic. Like that is, there's probably, I mean, some people use method like Max Martin and all these people, but like, I think there is something special. It depends on the genre as well. Mm. But I think those, that is the hardest thing to do and writing that and doing something that sounds new, that's, like maybe unique in its own way and like that can be very difficult to get right and it can take a lot of time and, and there's something magical about it and those moments they just I don't know they just kind of come and you I have a whole me like for me it's all very much like it's all in my head and I just have to like be really quiet and then I can hear it that's kind of how I I write um or like I like to improvise and stuff like that like but to write like a, a, a decent good song. And that's the first thing you got to get to. You got to write every day until you get to the point that you could pick up a guitar and improvise a song that someone sitting in front of you would be like, that was good. And then you go, yeah, but it's not good enough. And they would probably be like, no, it is. That's why I'd listen to that song. And you'd be like, yeah, yeah but you wouldn't really. Um, <laughs> but it's like a convincing enough like verse, pre-chorus and good words, yeah. whatever get to that point and to that point that you like writing songs and that's just practice learning is that every method. day every day doing every it. day multiple songs a day or one song a day or whatever just as much as you can figuring out who you are what it is you like to write about how you write what you're good at what type of writing you're good at and then it's the like okay how do i write those special songs how do you write like but it's just like it's like you know chris martin and coldplay and he talks about yellow it's just an accident you yeah, know? and they were in like 15 minutes or something crazy. Yeah, he was that. just joking. He was like playing a chord and he was pretending to be like Neil Young or whatever. And he was like, look at the stars. And then he was like, uh, look how they shine for you and everything you do. And he was like, and then I wanted a word that was like, and it was our hero. And he didn't know what the word was going to be. And then he saw the yellow pages, like a book, you know. And he was like, it was all yellow. <laughs> he was just taking the piss, like sitting outside the studio. They were working on a whole album. And like he was just on a little break and that's when he wrote Yellow. So it's like, that's magic and that's accent. But obviously he had the skills yeah. for that magic to be able to happen. If he didn't know how to write songs, it wouldn't fall out of him like that. But because his guard was down, it was like, I, it, it, and a lot of the best songs are, are written like that in a sort of accidental, just What other stories things. are there? Do you know any other ones that are accidental like that? Um, isn't there like the, the Beatles, uh, Paul McCartney woke up and he was singing... Um, Scrambled eggs. Everybody needs some scrambled eggs. Da, 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 da. And he was just cooking breakfast and he was like, and he went to the studio and he was like, I swear this is a song. Cause it's like, he was like, it's, is it like a jazz standard? Cause back then like jazz standard, blah, 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 all these jazz kind of things that everyone knows, you know? And he's like, is it a jazz standard I heard? And he played it for everyone, the producer, the guys in the studio, the band. And everyone was like, no, I don't know it. I don't recognize it. And like, 
he just woke up and he was like scrambled eggs yesterday you know and then it just became oh my god yesterday and it's yeah there's a lot of songs max martin wrote uh hit me baby one more time he was in bed like i've had so many moments like this where i have to sneak out of the bed and like go to my voice and like (laughs) and like but he was like in bed and he had like a voice noter and he gets out and he had just had this man like hit me baby one more time it's kind of me and he was just kind of just vibing like one night and he was like okay i'll just just finish that maybe tomorrow or whatever you know insane so he didn't try to craft it it's just sometimes i think you're getting inspired by so many things going around and eventually a couple of things will like mesh together and like become one and it'll just become like a song in your head and you'll just like randomly one thing that happens to me so much, which is really weird, is I'll listen to a song for the first time. Yeah. And when it gets to like, the, I love a good chorus, you know, when it gets to the chorus or the pre-chorus, in my head before it happens, I'll, I'll hear this like melody that I love. And it'd be like, it could be like, it happened to me with, uh, with uh, if you ever want to fall in love. That was one of those moments I was like driving to the gym and I was listening uh, just to like some, I don't know what, this random song is Spotify was just playing. And there was a song and then it just, and it, and it just before the chorus started, I paused so I wouldn't hear what the chorus of the song was. And I, in my head, heard, if you ever want to fall in love, if you ever want, whatever it was. And I just like voice noted it and I was just like, and then I played the song and it was something completely different. And then I would have these moments so regularly would I be like, I'm kind of, I was disappointed by what was in the song compared to what I like heard in my mind or what I wanted it to be. Yeah. And, uh, and then I started to be like, that's such a funny thing from now on. I'm going to like try and like once I can feel like, oh, I've got something coming. I'm going to like pause it and like sing my own thing or like sing my own thing over it, you know? It's like an explosion. Yeah, because it's all like getting just inspired. And if you suddenly get a, a melody gets inspired, like you just got to record it. You got to lay it down. Oh, man. You know, I freaking love this, dude. <laughs> this has been insane. Hey, um, Thanks, man. so you got NTAs tomorrow. I mean, I, I just want everyone to go and check out all your music. You can check it out on Spotify, on Apple Music. You can check it out everywhere. Check out your right. social media as well. We're going to leave all the tags below. Dude, I, I just want to say a huge thank you. I know thank how you. busy you are, and to give us time has been amazing. Um, I'm a huge supporter from the Wings. Just watch it. It's thank just you. insane what you're doing. And just thank you for being open and honest today. Before you go, I just I suppose a good thing maybe to say is that if you... You know, I, I love this advice that you were saying earlier, which I've always lived by, which is where rather than going for fame, you go for the love of it. And it's the same, I think, with money. There's a great saying, which is business is paid in two currencies, cash and experience. Take the experience first, the cash will come later. Don't worry about the cash. If you have advice for someone out there, what would you give advice to someone listening? Well, I was actually just thinking about this while we were talking that for me, because of like touching on what we spoke about earlier and I'll try to be quick, but because of everything I've been through, the, you know, where I came from, the sort of childhood that I had, all these situations, the way that people treated me in school, I then sort of began to realize and like, you know, people are always like, I'm very sorry for what you've been through and all this. And I know that I went through that because it is who, what has made me who I am. And I knew that if I could turn it into something positive, like being an artist and writing songs and telling my story and telling those real stories about my life to help other people that are going through similar things now or have gone through similar things and didn't have the support system to help them. And I think it is so important to find your why, like why it is you want to do something. I I just like helping people with music. If I wanted to just put songs, if I, if I love just writing songs, I would write them and I would keep them to myself and I wouldn't do anything with them. Yeah, I love performing as well. It makes me feel great and you get to connect with an audience. But most importantly, I like... I, I, the moments in my life where someone has come up to me or wrote, written me a message and been like, I'm going through what you went through right now. Or I went through the same thing and I'm still trying to like come out the other side I'm still trying to like you know f- figure out how to do what I love and so it's like I want to help people who first of all feel like maybe it's it's basically that like when you're in those situations often you feel like you're you're worthless you're you know your own parent doesn't love you how can you go off and do something special with your life well you can you can have ado- those dreams you can have any dream you want and you can achieve it you can go out and that's why I named the album Victory because it's this idea of like whatever you've come from, whoever you are, it doesn't matter 
what city you grew up in, how your family treated you, how people treat like if you believe in yourself and there's something you want to do, you you have to chase it and you have to do the thing you love because that's what life is about and you don't have it's not a given. You don't have tomorrow, you don't have forever, you know, it's not a million lives as far as we know it. You have this one life right now. And it is so important to just do something you love and try to be happy, especially when you're coming from situations like where I came from and stuff. And I just want to inspire those people also just to 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 sort of know that like they're not alone. And if they have these goals and if they feel sometimes, you know, like they're they're not good enough or whatever, that's not true. You know, you are everyone's good enough. You can you can do anything you want. And there's nothing special, more special about the next person or the other. It's just about believing in yourself and like trying to achieve those things. And for me, that's that is what I hope my music transmit. I hope it just inspires people, makes people feel heard, less alone, and maybe encourages them to to be themselves, do what they love, and and you know, to not let their like past like define them in a negative way. That's what I said, Ken. Honestly, dude, I really appreciate it, man. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Listen, everybody, we'll see you next week. Goodbye. Goodbye.